Well, we were on topic last week um, of temptation and learn from Jesus how to deal with temptations. And uh, we had some questions, specific questions, um, about temptations presented right at the end of the, the class. And we would like to go further into those, and, and certainly we'll have the opportunity. But um, our next topic on our list was also learning from Jesus how to give of ourselves. Mm -hmm. And um, with... Uh, Easter being on everyone's mind today and so much of the world uh, acknowledging uh, such a wonderful occasion, uh, we thought we'd tie those two in and uh, focus on how to give of ourselves, which again is relevant for us right now. Um, but there's a way that we can deal with both those topics, isn't there, John? We could uh, maybe talk, just kind of mention temptations and... Uh... The temptation of Jesus, and maybe kind of ease into giving. And uh, I think probably or possibly one of the best uh, chapters in the Bible on humility would be Philippians chapter 2. And uh, later on, I, th I guess if we have time, I'd like to get to that when we talk about learning to give from how Jesus gave. And uh, he <laughs> gave up everything that that was uh, heavenly to him to come to this earth in the flesh. Yep. And so that's, you know, it's, I, I believe the uh, text says something on the order of pouring out. Let's, let's go there, John, because uh, we've talked about the idea that um, Jesus' temptations were a way that he gave of himself, right? Yes. And um, I think maybe this is a good connection there, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, verse 7 says he emptied himself. Uh, we'll go back to verse 5. And uh, when we come to, to learning from Jesus how to give of ourselves, we're going to start in verse 1. But verse 5, uh, as we make this transition from, from Jesus allowing himself to be tempted, that's what he gave. He gave, <laughs> he emptied himself of everything that he had so that he could come and be made a little lower than the angels. Have this mind among yourselves, which is also uh, yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And so we uh, can think we, we don't have near as much to give as he did. Uh, but that idea and that attitude that we have in ourselves. Uh, and I think those are some of, the, some of the basics that we need to give. First of all, is we need to to have the attitude of Christ, and as we look at the likeness of Christ, it's not so much maybe specifically things that he did, but attitudes and spirit that he had to allow that giving. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you know, when we talk about Jesus giving of himself, in, in you know, this passage does a great job of embodying all that he gave, as you're mm -hmm. pointing out. Um, you know, and we remember the death of Christ every week and um, partake of the Lord's Supper to, to not just follow the example of the New Testament Christians, but to remember in our lives just how important of a sacrifice that was and what it means to us and how precious it is. But um, Jesus' giving was a lot more than just that two-day period, um, you know, leading up to being crucified and in the three days in the grave. From the very begin beginning, emptying himself was that I think it, we can in some ways understand what he went through in his death. It's, it's beyond what we are challenged with. But I really don't believe I can wrap my mind around what he gave up to become man. 
I don't think that's humanly possible. Yeah. And I think, as, for example, one thing that uh, when Peter, one of the occasions when Peter was going to save Jesus, uh, he says, don't you know I could call 12 legions of angels? And so he still had that capability, but he gave it up. And uh, a lot of times we, we see people that are even to the point of being a martyr for a cause. And uh, sometimes we don't have that same capability. We can't just walk away from it. Yeah. But he was here to face temptations and to, to offer himself as the once for all sacrifice. Right. It's, uh, uh, great, as we pointed out last week, that it was needed, you know, for him to be able to relate to, to God from our standpoint. Um, Maybe, uh, you know, as you referred earlier, we, we spring things on each other. So what do we learn? If Jesus' temptation was a way of giving of himself, what do we learn from our temptations, how they can be of service? Well, in his, uh, in his temptations, of course, he was uh, really identifying with, with humanity. And uh, there are times when we just really need to identify with uh, with others, <laughs> recognize what temptations are, sometimes place ourselves in some pretty uncomfortable situations. Uh, there are things that, that we do that we don't feel like doing, but, but God calls us to do them. Right. Um, you know, maybe that's part of what James is talking about. And James, in the first chapter, is talking about the benefit to us, where he says, count it all joys when you fall into divers or different, King James says temptations, um, but trials is what he's talking about, which are very closely related to what we think of as temptations, because a trial is going to present probably numerous kinds of temptations. And um, one of the questions we ask is, how can we count it joy to have this tremendous trial? On our, um, on our shoulder. Um, but when we understand we can be of service to others through that, that mind of Christ that Jesus had in Philippians mm -hmm. 2, um, that I think it helps us understand I can, I can use this to, to be a benefit to others. Yes, whatever the cost. The cost, even our failures. Yes. Um, one of the prayers that I have, uh, John, and I'm hesitant to pray it, but I force myself to pray it. And I mentioned last week, I'm telling you how hesitant I am in my prayer life here the last couple weeks. Uh, but I ask for God to use me in the ways He sees fit. That's difficult for me to pray. Because I look at some of the prophets of the Old Testament, and that thought terrifies me. And I look, think of, you know, how he used the apostles. And to pray to God, use me as you see fit, is a terrifying thought for me. Mm -hmm. But yet I, I pray it because he ultimately does see best. He does best. He, he knows best. One of the uh, things that we've looked at, uh, and, and also in our study at Mark on Wednesday nights, uh, fortunately, he doesn't just show us all the good things and right things that they did, but they had their failures too, and, uh, and there are some Old Testament prophets who God called to do things, and they were not willing Right. And sometimes, like Jonah, they just flat out said, no, I'm not going to do it. Well, of course he did. <laughs> God will see that we accomplished, that his will is accomplished. Uh, but, you know, he was one, Elijah, the, the, the epitome of prophets. Uh, wasn't always willing to, to do what he was called to do, but he ended up doing what God wanted. Yep, absolutely. And so as, you know, we... we may not look at everything with joy and say, yippee, this is what I want to do, but, but we eventually, hopefully, grow and surrender ourselves to, to God's will, and we help each other also. Right, right. And, you know, 
you mentioned the failures of these great men. And this is something that I wonder if we as God's people don't mention enough. And, and I'm not saying that you go out and sin because that's going to further God's cause. In fact, that's really what uh, Paul's dealing with at the end of Romans, the fifth chapter, and into verse six. He's saying, hey, um, where sin abounds, grace all the more abounds. And uh, God is able to deal with your problems. Um, so then verse 6 starts with, what shall we say? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And of course, the, the answer seems obvious when we have the answer. May it never be. Yeah, may it never no, be. No way. <laughs> no way. Or King James says, God forbid, yeah. you know, which seems like a strong term uh, to me. Um, so the answer is no way. But having said that, I think sometimes we underestimate. I, I see so many people get discouraged because of their own failing, which I can relate to, um, but then say, I, I'm done with the church. I just, I'm not going to be a hypocrite. I'm not going to bring shame upon the church. I'm, I'm not going to allow people to see that that's what God's children are. And boy, my heart breaks for them because I can relate in some ways. But really the message of scripture is that God can use you. God wants you. And God can use you through your weaknesses to help others. I think one of the uh, best examples of that is uh, Peter. <laughs> uh, Again, one of the times when he was going to save Jesus, he's, he's going to get this thing turned around and get Jesus corrected and, and uh, get, the, get the new world order all straightened out. And uh, Jesus tells him, he says that Satan has asked for permission to sift you like wheat. And he did. And Jesus said, I've prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And then he says, and when you return, strengthen your brothers. And so he, he knew, Jesus knew, and he prayed for Peter, and he said, you know, I, I don't want your faith to fail. We might look at it, Peter might have looked at it and said, what have I done? I just got done saying I, I would stand by Jesus if it meant going to, to prison and to jail with him, and to death with him. Yep. And look what I did. I've... I'm no good, I'm no use, I'm just not part of this anymore. And that's, and that's kind of what you're saying. And I, yeah. There aren't very many folks that we know well that have been in the church that have just flat out denied Jesus like that. Right. And, and of course, Jesus had prayed that his faith wouldn't fail. It sure took a big plunge. Yes, it did. But it didn't fail, and that, God turned that around and used Peter in a very powerful way. He okay. did strengthen his brothers when he returned. Absolutely. And, and I think parallel with that, it's useful for us to remember that John, the 20th chapter, where Jesus is coming to Peter and he says, Peter, do you love me? And he asked that three times. I think there's significance in that because Peter, I, I reference John 20 because that's after the resurrection. It's after Peter's denial. Yes. And I think there's significance. Three times Jesus says to Peter, gets him to reaffirm his faith. Yes, and this was after Jesus had forgiven him. Yes. <laughs> you know, and you kind of think, you know, I, I kind of thought this was over. And, uh, and it even says after the third time that Jesus asked, and it said Peter had hurt feelings. Well, sure you would. Yeah. Yes, he would. It, but Jesus' final words there, then feed my sheep. Mm -hmm. He's saying, then do what I've empowered you. Do what I've asked you to do. And um, there's how one of the main ways we can use our own temptations, even failures. And he indicates Peter. how Peter was going to die for him. And it wasn't pretty. No, it wasn't. 
Anything else on the connection between temptation and giving of ourselves, John? Yes. Let's, may we go to Matthew chapter 5? Let's do it. Sermon on the Mount. And uh, let's go to Matthew 5, verse 43. And, uh, and I think the way this kind of ties into temptations is we're really tempted to not love people like this. You've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. For he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Therefore, you must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. And of course, the perfection here is when we love other people, when you give, it's, it's really the temptation to, what's in this for me? What am I going to get back from this? And we can't do that. We need to develop the mentality to, to not do that. Yeah. If Jesus had given that way, boy, I'd be in trouble. We would all be in trouble. Yeah. Uh, and <laughs> you and I have discussed loaning money before. How much do I owe you now? <laughs> I don't want to mention that publicly, but it's okay. a lot. Uh, and, my, and my personal policy, mine and my wife's, is that we don't loan money. If we have it and somebody needs it, we give it. When you loan money, it kind of almost goes against this passage, doesn't it? Yeah, I can see. And I'm, and I'm yeah. sure not criticizing people. I know there are a lot of people that loan money all the time. And, uh, and that's a personal decision. It's not a test of fellowship or a matter of faith. Uh, but I think it makes it a whole lot easier to maybe observe passages like this. And if you can develop that trait to give and not expect anything at all. Uh, because, you know, as we've discussed, there are times when you give something to somebody and find out they went out and sold it and kept the money. <laughs> and, well, I, not, not what I had in mind. Um, I've got a comment here. Boy, we're... Um a couple comments. We're getting a lot in here. If I miss your comments, I'm I'm sorry, but uh, and I enjoy seeing you guys encourage one another on here. And I'll take this opportunity. I, I cannot believe I forgot to mention this. Brian Stein from the Cherry Tree area was baptized yesterday. Ooh, wonderful! And so that's wonderful. just a wonderful occasion. I've I've known Brian for some years, and that's brightened my day yesterday. So uh, to hear that. Um, so it, there's been a lot of encouragement towards Brian and, and others. So I, if I miss a comment, and I apologize. But Stephanie says, God uses broken. He, with purpose, uses us to turn our mess into our message. Well, that's, that's uh, put together so well she could be a kindergarten teacher. She could. <laughs> um, but it, it, truly a great, um, great phrase and great verbiage. Uh, God uses the broken. Uh, he, with purpose, uses us to turn our mess into his message. And, and that's so true. And I, I think about also what you had said earlier that, you know, the, the last part of Romans 5 and the first part of chapter 6, you know, because uh, there's always sufficient grace to cover our sin, uh, should we go out and really, and God loves to give us his grace. So I'm going to do him a favor. I'm going to go out and just sin all I can so he can lavish grace on me. Uh, God forbid. Uh, we make enough mistakes. We break enough things when we're not trying to. Absolutely. Uh, that, <laughs> that God can, and, and does use those things to really further his cause. Absolutely.
Champs League. Bill Fiscus says, we look at our feeble skills and abilities and say, I can't do much, but fail to believe that God has the ability to give those skills if we have the faith. Mm -hmm. And boy, there's that. Another great comment, great, great point, uh, Kevin. Yes, and I and you look at uh, at the disciples uh, knew that Jesus was a very busy man, and so when people brought their children for Jesus to bless, the disciples knew he didn't have time for that. Kind of shooed him away, and and Jesus, the uh, this is a a rough paraphrase by me, but this is the way I see it, Jesus in essence, says, if I don't have time for the children and the adults, the adults can go away, bring the kids over here. And uh, Isaiah, one of the phrases out of Isaiah 11, a small child shall lead them. Jesus praises God that he sent the message that the children could believe and understand. Yeah, it's great. So when we think, you know, we're, we're not skilled enough and we're not qualified enough and we can look at people like uh, Gideon who God kept chipping away at his army until he had 300 men. When 30 started with 32,000, gets down to 300 and no weapons. And God says, now I can use you. Now I can use you, yep. Um, back to the children and, and I'll get around to maybe a temptation of, of us as a group. Um, you know, sometimes that picture we have where Jesus is reaching out to the children, and you look at a lot of the pictures, and these children are sitting orderly. <laughs> well, there's no mention of a miracle there, and that would have been a miracle. <laughs> um, you know, I, I truly picture those children scampering about and kind of climbing on Jesus and and things that, because that's children, that's, that's what children do, and, and um, I think we need to remember what use God has for children um, in, in his purpose. Yes, so. and we do tend to forget that a lot. We did the FaceTime with, uh, which I really enjoy, with my youngest son and his family in Michigan, and uh, that was nice last night. The last time we did it, my three-year-old granddaughter held the camera. <laughs> I was exhausted when it was over. <laughs> Run. And seasick. Oh, yes. I needed the drama made. <laughs> but it was wonderful. What a, what a blessing our children are. Absolutely. Absolutely. Anything else on temptation? Not this week. Not this week. All right. So if you have specific question, I think um, you had asked um, where temptation comes from, if I remember correct. Looking at you, Sharon. Didn't you type that? So uh, if there's any specific questions on temptations we can get to, please submit those questions, and we'll certainly be willing to come back mm -hmm. to them. You know, as we turn, I wanted to look at Luke 12 and 50. I mentioned this to you Wednesday night, kind of in a different context, but fits our topic this morning. Um, when we think about what we're going to leave in life, it's, there's something inherently within us, I think God-given, that we'd like to leave something positive for the world. You know, what am I going to do? I keep that in mind when I teach my children. Maybe that's the most concentrated gift that I get to leave, or curse, <laughs> depending, right? Uh, that I get to leave the world with is what I teach my children. Now, they get to use that however they see fit. Um, but we all want to leave something behind. We want to contribute to um, something great. And when we think about what Jesus did for the world, it's amazing. Um, I'm mindful of Napoleon's comments on Jesus. He says, that man did more with love this is rough mic paraphrase, than you know, any army could do with, with weapons. And um, he has done that. He's revolutionized the world. And um, you know, there's a great example there for us about um, what we leave behind. Um, and 
Jesus had something. I mentioned Luke 12 and 50. And Jesus says, I have a baptized to be baptized with. And how great is my distress until it is accomplished. You know, James and John, and I'll use this again this morning. Uh, James and John send their mother to ask Jesus, uh, can my boys sit on your right and your left hand? And amongst what he says to them is, are you able to be baptized with the baptism I'm going to be baptized with? He's talking about being immersed in suffering and anguish. And they say, of course we are. I have no idea what they're saying. Um, here Jesus is saying, I have a baptized to be baptized with. And until it happens, I am sorely distressed. Or how great is my distress? Um, Jesus had a mission that he was laser focused in. And sometimes we get tired of people. And uh, sometimes it feels like everyone in our lives are reaching out to get something. And I think we see that in Jesus somewhere. He got fatigued, you know, and he had to take breaks. Um, but he was laser focused on leaving something great behind. And he, he couldn't be bothered with anything else mm -hmm. because it was consuming him. And I think that's the idea of Christianity. Jesus did not raise from the dead. He did not spiritually raise you from the dead to sin. One of the uh, phrases, one of the quotes that I like uh, so well is that Jesus did not come to make bad people good. He came to give dead people life. Oh, that's great. Yeah, and I think a lot of times we kind of almost think if we could baptize people and make them really good people by our standards, and we've accomplished his will. And his will really is to recognize that uh, apart from him, we have no life. Absolutely. Absolutely. And lack of life would be a demonstration of not having him. Yes. Uh, I, I read a, um, old, um, a quote from an old preacher who, who felt compelled from this experience to become evangelistic. That after um, his conversion to Christ, he was so focused on all the things he ought not do that one day he's sitting in his yard or in his back porch reading the Bible and he sees his dog out in the yard chewing on a bone and he says, Old Rover there is possibly the best Christian I know. <laughs> and and when we look at Jesus, it's not about what we don't do. As you said, it's about life. Yes. It's about what we do, what we reach out. And uh, so what a great topic this morning to learn how to give of ourselves. Um, of course, Jesus' um, time, a lot of it was consumed with teaching, wasn't it? Yeah, I think in, uh, in our study in Mark, as a matter of fact, he, Mark begins with Jesus doing miracles and you know, the power and the immediacy. And I think it's around verse, chapter 1, around verse 37 maybe, that uh, he said, let us go into some towns so that we could preach. So I could preach. That's what I came for. Yes. And um, at some point thereabouts, uh, we see, he says, we have to go on so we can preach elsewhere. Yes. You know, um, so he spent a lot of his time preaching and teaching. Um, but something I think that's so interesting about Jesus' teaching is, and with Facebook right now, boy, we, uh, we really have a heavy dose of this. Here's why I believe. If you don't believe it, you're stupid. You know, and just pushing your ideas, and, and some of them are... Some of these ideas are interesting, right? I, I guess sometimes I'm stupid. <laughs> I don't see it. I see a lot of stupidity in myself when I read a lot of those things. Um, but you take Nicodemus in John 3, um, the woman at the well in John 4, uh, and you go on through these ideas. Jesus had every opportunity to be exactly like that. But what we see him doing is, in short, for time's sake, is we're all about, is he goes to where they are. Mm -hmm. He relates to them 
and he gives them a way to be lifted up to a higher plane. Yes. And a lot of his teachings were, if, if you could put yourself in their place, what would you have understood if you were Nicodemus? <laughs> right. This is weird. I don't, I don't understand this at all. Or the woman at the well. Yep. And, you know, to tie it in to what we were saying, ways, saying in part to Nicodemus, is you're going to have to become a whole new man. Mm -hmm. Completely new. And, and there's our task. Um, any closing thoughts before we... Uh, do we have a half an hour? We do, but we don't. My closing thoughts would be this. Uh, Romans 12. I looked at Romans 12 because it really talks about us giving, and, and uh, we're all different. And that's what Romans 12 tells us, that we offer our, our physical bodies as a living sacrifice, and that God has different gifts for each of us to give. And so there are things that you are really skilled in that I would just be a total flop, and vice versa. And, and we all work together as the body of Christ. And I think sometimes we get the idea that here's how I'm giving, and here's what I'm going to do, and I know you have a, an evangelism course coming up here, and, uh, and I am really looking forward to that. Not everybody can do that, and sometimes we get the idea that it's such a good thing, everybody ought to do it, and why can't you understand that, and, and uh, that's not what everybody's meant for. Yeah, especially in the same way. We can all reach people. We're not going to reach them the same way. No, we're not. Absolutely.